Afternoon. So I'll give Tom another round of applause. That was a really excellent talk. Well done, Tom. That was really good. OK. Um, <clears throat> oh, I'm mic'd on. Good. 1981, John Michael Osborne, more famously known as Ozzy Osborne, goes to CBS Records to sign a recording contract. He decided he was going to bring two doves to release at the end of the deal as a peace offering to the executives. Yeah. Instead, he drunkenly lets one go and bites the head off the other. <laughs> Proof. A year later, in Des Moines, Iowa, a 17-year-old fan takes an unconscious bat throws it up on stage, Ozzy picks the critter up and bites its head off too. No, Ozzy does not have rabies. <laughs> the reason I'm telling you this is that metal, heavy metal, the type of music that Ozzy helped popularize is filled with all sorts of extremes. And so they say the path to hell is paved by good intentions. You know, maybe the question is how do we get here? So brief musical timeline. 1930s and 40s, swing music dominates the landscape. 1956, Elvis makes his debut. Bit of a game changer right there. 1960, The Beatles. 1962, The Rolling Stones. 1964, there we go. The Who. 1966, Jimi Hendrix Experience. 1968, Eureka! Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath led by frontman Ozzy Osbourne, enter the stage as the first heavy metal bands. Since then, there's been a tremendous growth of the heavy metal genre itself in terms of the enormous number of subgenres. If we were to name a contemporary list, we'd have black metal, Christian metal, death metal, dark metal, doom metal. It goes along. Extreme metal, folk metal, yes, folk metal. Industrial, metalcore, power progressive, Speed, Stoner, Symphonic, Thrash, and of course, just plain old heavy metal. So, you know, you can imagine though that with all these different subgenres of music, that whenever people get together for a concert, you know, whether they be tens of people or tens of thousands of people, they're gonna wanna dance, right? It's music. This is what we as human beings do when we listen to music. Um, but if you've never been to a metal show, you may be surprised by how people dance at these events. And so uh, I guess I should give some kind of warning about what you're about to see. Please do not try this at home. I guess some people know what they're about to say. Come on, as a metalhead, I'm allowed to air guitar, right? I'm allowed to geek out the music that I enjoy listening to, right? Come on. Yeah, so this is called moshing. I guess some people know this. <laughs> All right, let me tell you a short story. So, um, a couple years ago, a couple years ago, I took a date to her first metal show. Yeah, I know what's wrong with that. You don't need to tell me. <laughs> took a date to her first metal show, and normally, I would be at the very front of the audience, all the way over there, because I want the full body contact experience. That's what I'm there to metal show for. Um, this time, things were different, obviously. And so instead, we stayed off on the side and had a view of the audience somewhat similar to what you're seeing here. And it just so happened that at about that time in my academic career, uh, I was learning in physics about collective behavior and emergent phenomena. And from this view outside the mosh pit, which I'd never had before in my life, I'm looking down into the crowd, completely distracted from what's happening on stage. And I'm looking at the people like, holy crap, I know what that is. We studied that in class last week. Ooh. And so this idea, this observation stuck with me for a couple of years. Uh, when I got to grad school at Cornell uh, in the physics program there, I started working collaboratively with a couple of people. And basically what we did was we took this initial observation and then we started downloading YouTube videos. Uh, we wrote some custom software to track and quantify the motion of people uh, in these crowds and we started analyzing them as a physicist would. And one of the things that we found 
was that when you look at the statistics of how people move in a mosh pit, it's the same type of motion that you see from molecules of air in the gas around us. So the way that these molecules are bouncing around every which way is the same way people are bouncing around in those mosh pits. Yeah, right? <laughs> And so as physicists, again, you know, we see this kind of quantitative relationship. The immediate instinct is to say, aha, let's write down some equations and let's see what happens. Let's see if we can understand what's going on. And so um, Newton's second law is a good place to start. This is the famous equation. Maybe you know it already. It's force equals mass times the acceleration. For people, you need to write Newton's second law with some slight changes. But let's see. This is my one equation in the slide. I'm allowed to do that, right? Uh, so we've got Newton's second law for people. Force of propulsion, that is the force that I generate to move forward. Force of repulsion, that's what happens when two people collide. They bounce off each other. Force of flocking, now this is interesting. This is the tendency for people to follow other people around them. Okay, that's important. And then the force of noise, that's what happens when you're looking at your cell phone and not really paying attention to you know, where you're walking or if you've had a few too many to drink. Noise, randomness. Uh, we took this, uh, these equations. We stuffed them into a numerical simulation and let it run. This is an example of what we saw in our simulations. <laughs> you can imagine this as the view from above the crowd looking down. The black dots are the people who are moshing. The white dots are the people in the crowd who don't want to. <laughs> the red arrows, those are the forces or the directions that people are moving in. And the size of the red arrows is the magnitude of the force that's acting on the individuals. And so it turns out that when we run the simulations and we analyze what's going on, we again see the same statistics that we saw in the YouTube videos. And so physically, it turns out that there's some kind of mathematical theorem called the central limit theorem, blah, 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 that explains what's going on. But it turns out there's something else that was very interesting that I want to show you, too, that was also in the model. It's this. I mentioned that there was a flocking force that was the tendency for people to follow each other. As we increased the flocking force in the model, made it more and more significant, we saw that these simulations led to groups of people that were running around in a big old circle like that. This, they went from this disordered, chaotic, mosh pit-like gas and they turn into some kind of ordered vortex. Like, yeah, come on, we're watching, we're looking at this thing, it's like, yeah, that's not real, that's totally an artifact, right? Like, there's no way in heck that this could be real, our model is totally bunk, it's overly simplified. Yeah, you guys get where I'm going with this, right? Let me just show you the video. This is Kill Switch Engage. They're a pretty good band, I really like them, actually. And uh, they're, they're just about to start their set. I had to mute the audio for this because it's not all ages appropriate, but take a look what they're doing here. People are coming out, and lo and behold, Right, like maybe that's a one-time thing, right? Maybe like, you know, we just got lucky and that's like the only time that's ever, no, no come on. All right, here, here's another compilation video. <laughs> I'm actually in this crowd here, all the way in the back. This is Rock and Ring in Germany. I went with a couple of friends for a long weekend. It was a good time. Uh, about 100,000 people went to that event. This is the largest circle pit I've ever seen ever. Huge. <laughs> and there's an important point I want to make here, and that's that in the modeling, and the mathematical modeling of the crowd. We didn't insert circle pits. We didn't insert the statistics of gases. That those are the things that emerge naturally, okay? These are predictions that the model makes. And when we see that the model is able to quantitatively capture what we see in the mosh pits and then accurately predict other types of qualitative behaviors, that hints to us that we've captured some sort of essential core underlying concepts in the way that we as people move collectively. Now, full disclosure, we didn't invent these equations. They actually were written down maybe two decades ago and have been used in many other contexts. I'm showing you some other examples of where they've been applied successfully. And I think one of the really interesting food, uh, bits of food for thought on this one is that the equations of collective motion apply equally as well for birds, for fish, and for bacteria, and that these physical laws remain the same. And so you know, when we think of ourselves, we have some kind of rich interior existence. We have thoughts, we have emotions, we have desires, dreams, wishes. And we think that trying to describe that in physics language would be too daunting of a task. Well, maybe for individuals, behaviorally, that's too complex. But for groups of people, well, we're right on the plane with the bacteria. It's interesting. In terms of applications, 
um, there's actually a very nice way that this can actually benefit society in large. And um, think about this. If you go to a major sporting event, the Olympics or something, if you go to a, a presidential inauguration, if you go to a massive concert, there are people who are being paid, who specifically their job is to manage security. And they're, they're up there, and they're thinking, what happens if there's a fire? What happens if there's an earthquake? What happens if there's a, an explosion? What happens if something goes wrong? How do we protect people in the panic that ensues? And so I would suggest that if you want to understand how people are going to behave in those very extreme social circumstances, you'd want to go and study people in other very socially extreme circumstances. Now, it's clearly not ethical to start a riot for the sake of science, but a mosh pit, I would say, is a pretty good substitute. Uh, I mentioned that this was a collaborative project. Um, this guy, Matt Bierbaum, he did all the simulation work, so I really got a, you know, hats off for him. He's just been fantastic to work with. Uh, he actually took the simulation and ported it over to an online version and posted it on his website, runat.me. It's one of the new top-level domains. And uh, you can actually go online right now and make your own mosh pit simulation. You can play with all the same knobs and dials that we did in our research, and you can see these things reproduced right there on your own computer. Uh, we were advised by two really cool people, Jim Setha and Itai Cohen. Uh, Jim basically looked like this throughout the duration of the project. <laughs> I only have positive things to say about Itai and his dressing style. <laughs> and um, I think I just want to close. I want to say thank you to the bands that helped inspire this research. I want to thank you guys for showing up to this. And I want to say thanks to the TEDx Yale team who've been doing a fantastic job putting all this together today. Let's give them a round of applause, huh? Thank you.